Listen up, get ready, I'm not gonna take no more. There's a revolution, a revelation going on in my soul. Buckle up, get ready, we're not gonna sit back. Okay, now we're gonna bring on our first guest for this week's Live from the Heartland, and it is for the July 1st show. We are recording on the 28th, I repeat. And I'm really honored to bring on Lydia Wilson, who is the culture editor of the new magazine, New Lines, which uh, a fellow Rogers Park 49th Ward neighbor, Danny Postal, works with. And he led me to this great article by Lydia Wilson and, and Rasha Al-Akidi. Both of them are editors for the new magazine, New Lines. And uh, they have an article in the current issue and I'll read the title. It's a long title. How Andrew Tate and the Far Right Made Common Cause with Islamists. Western groups find in Muslim communities what they believe is a prototype for a social contract free of wokeism and women's liberation. Hi there, Lydia. Hi. Thank you for having me. Take it away. Tell us what the article is all about and what you two have uh, uncovered and what you've been working on for, I understand, a number of years. Well, yeah, it goes back a long way. Both of us, from very different perspectives, have been keeping an eye on what is known as the Manosphere, uh, which is a loose collection of online subcultures and communities, but they're bound by common things. One is misogyny, um, a real feeling that anything wrong with their life, any lack of status, any change, anything like not being able to get a girl, not being able to find the life you want. Um, the common culprit is usually feminism or women. Women are taking our jobs. Women don't know their place. It was when gender roles changed that life started going wrong for men. That's the theory kind of really grouping together the manosphere. It encompasses a few different attitudes within that, um, but misogyny and, and, and this longing for a traditional gender um, role and traditional family structures really, really group these people together. And now, sadly, there's, that also comes with hefty homophobia and also a lot of conspiracy and also um, a lot of anti-Semitism. So that it's really some, some murky, dodgy corners of the Internet. Um, and what we noticed after many years of monitoring it is this stuff wasn't staying in these murky corners. It was going fairly mainstream and we were seeing it come out onto the social media platforms, onto media, mainstream media, and in our politicians' uh, speeches. And so it, it, the, the stakes are getting higher all the time. So that's the manosphere. What we were also noticing, it was hard to miss, <laughs> um, was that there was an increasing interest in Islam. Now, when I say hard to miss, it's in the title of the article, Andrew Tate made this phenomenon hard to miss. He really brought it into the limelight. Um, and for anyone who who doesn't know who Andrew Tate is, lucky you. And he's I know who he was. I know I saw that he uh, has been charged uh, in uh, Romania, I believe, on some stuff. Okay. You could fill us in, but I my whereas my engineer Hal knows who he is. I never had heard of him before. Well, if you were at school in the United Kingdom right now, I think it's probably over 90% of children who know who he is. So he's a big, a massive influencer. He he is an online influencer. He, he, he draws his fame from a variety of different ways, but um, his fame has been growing all the time. And um, yeah, recently... He started by being interested in Islam quite publicly, saying that it was the, the the last strong religion, the last hope for the world. And then he made that final step and converted. Now, lots of people think um, he was doing it for attention. It doesn't seem that way. Um, he's had Qurans with him ever since he converted. He talks about the Quran. He has discussions. It, it, I, I, you know, nobody can see into his heart, uh, but it doesn't, it doesn't seem flippant. 
But at the same time, he is not giving up pretty un-Islamic behavior. And that's what he's in trouble for in Romania. He's been running a um, pornographic sex ring and he's in he's been he's been under house arrest for a while. And then recently, just last week, I think, charged um, with with trafficking women for the purposes of sex work. And um, and also he hasn't given up his drinking drug lifestyle, which he's also very, <laughs> he, he also propagates that. But despite this very un-Islamic behavior, he has been welcomed by a good chunk of, of, of Muslims who see this as, an, as, as a welcome um, understanding that Islam is the answer to a lot of society's ills right now. And um, his brother is charged too, I understand. Yeah, and a couple of others alongside, yeah. What is the basic uh, thing that brings the right and the and the traditional Muslims or conservative Muslims together? What are the forces uh, at work? Uh, was it an accident? Because uh, you know I'm pretty used to right wing bad mouthing not only blacks, women, gays, but also Islam. And uh, mm-hmm. this this was a oh something new is happening for me. How well, did it come to be? This is it. It is it. When you think about it through that lens of the far right, it is very surprising because they've traditionally been extremely Islamophobic and part, partly because of anti-immigration feelings, um, but partly because of um, Islamophobia relating to terrorism risks and those sorts of threats to society. But when you actually take a step back and look, and let me point out here that we were talking about a specific section of the far right and a very specific section of of Muslims. You know, this isn't this isn't this isn't by no means all. It's a very small fraction. But when you when you understand that actually a lot of their values are core values and shared. Uh, then it starts to feel a little bit more natural that um, if you do want traditional gender roles and traditional family structures, and if you don't want any LGBTQ rights in your societies, then actually you can see where they align. And that's where we've seen it most visibly over protests to do with LGBTQ um, teaching in schools. We've seen that all over the world, in fact. Certainly all over America, um, but also Canada and Britain, we've seen that we've seen far right factions and Muslims protest together against um, a more diverse, inclusive curriculum. Yeah, I did see that uh, some Muslims who uh, had received support from LGBT people back in the day uh, have now uh, kind of withdrawn, uh, said I shouldn't have participated where LGBT flags were. Um, Yeah. You know, the LGBT community and many others came out to support Muslims uh, after 9-11 when, uh, you know, they were getting blamed for everything. And um, now it's a shift. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And people are really rowing back on that. And it seems as if a lot of politicians have, have enabled it. Like, probably this isn't a shift in, in beliefs, but it's there's there's been an allowance to become more vocal. So we've got Trump, for example, who was always quite inclusive about LGBTQ back in the day, and he's moved radically on this position. And he says the kind of things that then then encourage other people to become more out in the open about about their beliefs, about women's roles and those sorts of things. And so I think what we've had is a culture um, partly stemming from the vicious culture wars online that have made these things more sayable. Lydia, you uh, already mentioned the manosphere, uh, where I guess people go to get uh, reinforced on their inadequacies, et cetera. But uh, they're also, uh, they refer to the matrix. They use the name from the, you know, Keanu Reeves film, I guess. But what does the matrix mean to them? Yeah, well, it's directly from the film, um, and actually it's called the Red Pill Movement because the Matrix is what's controlling us all. Um, And in conspiracy theories online, that can easily be formed of these um, shadowy forces pulling all the strings, um, who are often Jews um, in in the conspiracies, 
uh, it's a centuries old anti-Semitic trope to say that there are these secret forces behind the scenes controlling the banking and controlling the media. Um, and so that's how they're controlling us all. Now, in the film, uh, you can take a red pill to wake up to reality and escape the matrix, or you can take the blue pill and carry on in your illusion and carry on living your life very happily as before. Um, and so if you subscribe to this, people are always telling each other, take the red pill, wake up, become aware of, all, of what is really going on around us. And what's really going on is that some people are benefiting at the expense of men and men are losing out in this new world order. You talk about the traditional role of women in the Muslim societies and Muslim communities, which pretty much is being a homemaker, uh, raising the kids. But we know that in some countries, um, particularly those that are probably more affluent and looking a little bit more to the West, that started to change. Like women got to drive in, I think, Saudi Arabia. And uh, I, I imagine that the pressure from uh, women in those countries is is continues to move for uh, a more liberation and, and incrementally, I would think, of women. Um, what is the situation with traditional Muslims and are there other denominations of Muslims? I mean, is it is it one group of Muslims? Is it a small, small percentage, or is it? Uh, are there Muslims that like progressive United Church of Christ versus, uh, you know, Southern Baptists here in the United States? It's not so much about the different sects. It's more about the different cultural contexts they're living in. And of course, that varies hugely across the Muslim world. And women in many countries have markedly more success in certain sectors than in the West. But what's important here is not the reality of how how patriarchal or conservative a, a culture or a country is, is more to do with the perception amongst these groups in the manosphere. And the perception is these very traditional patriarchal structured hierarchical societies. So we see a lot of respect for strong leaders such as um, Putin or, or Saddam or Assad um, or Erdogan in, in Turkey. There are some, there's, there's real respect for that kind of strength at the top. And standing up for what's right and standing up for your country in a way that with all of our human rights discourse nobody they don't see people as standing up for their own culture in the same way and in that and and so yes there are there are many real examples across the muslim world of very of of women with with very few rights um relative to men um but i think what is more important is that perception that women know their place, that women raise the children, that as long as they're provided for, they're happy. And that's how to keep everybody happy. The men, the men are happy and the women are happy in that traditional structure. That's what they're really grabbing onto. Uh, one of the things that uh, really came up for me early on in the article, and then you do address it, is uh, there was an emerging alliance of the Muslim community say in Dearborn, where the largest concentration, Dearborn, Michigan, of Muslims, I think, are in the United States, um, and the left, or progressives. Uh, and that seems to be uh, a little bit uh, undermined or changing. Uh, we do have uh, two uh, Muslim Congress people, and uh, one of them, you know, represents Dearborn, and my understanding was there was a situation not in Dearborn, but Hamtramck maybe, or some town in Michigan where uh, they had celebrated pride every year. And then once the um, majority was Muslim on the city council, they reversed that on public property. And the left, who really felt like they had supported Muslims in their time of need, uh, called them out on it. But yeah. uh, this has implications for uh, the next election. Um, yeah. And I'm wondering your take on that. Oh, absolutely. There are political implications. And that left um, alliance is is prov is proving to be, let's say, not, not as stable as you might assume. 
Um, partly this is because the right is changing its discourse on, on Islam, um, which is half of our argument, that um, it's no longer uh, a knee-jerk Islamophobic response to any Muslim topic, but actually a lot of very prominent far-right commentators are welcoming Muslims onto their shows, onto their podcasts, and having very um, friendly, respectful conversations. So Islam is no longer being demonized in the same way on the right, which enables Muslims to feel more able to vote that way. Um, so that's part of it. And then the other part is the, the rising amount of um, homophobic, misogynistic legislation being 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 passed um, is means that the more conservative elements of any community, not just Muslims and not just Christians, but any very conservative, patriarchal, hierarchical culture will find things to like in this new right. Are there progressive Muslims these days or any groups of Muslims that uh, you can cite for us? And, uh, you know, I'm always looking for, well, if this is going south on us, what are we going to what are we going to do and who is out there to make alliances with and work I, with? I do need to stress I am talking about a very small amount. These are very conservative. It's it's not the norm. There are plenty of progressive Muslims. We've got a Labour um Muslim uh, mayor of London <laughs> at the moment here in the UK. Um, and and uh, don't you have a Muslim uh, uh, high up in office in Scotland? First Minister of Scotland, yes, yes. Um, and pro-gay marriage, actually, which sparked a huge backlash against him. That was one of the things, actually, we covered in the article. Um, that 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 was that was a bit of a lightning rod, actually, when he came out in support of gay marriage. Uh, so no, lots of prominent and 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 on the and on the right here in the UK, we have a very prominent Baroness Barcy, who um, who is a Tory. Uh, but she has very progressive values around around women and all sorts of things. Um, uh, so no, no, I'm not saying that that we we weren't at all arguing that the Muslim vote is shifting wholesale. No, it's a it's a fraction, but they're building an alliance, and that was something that was previously quite hard to imagine, and we can't say for certain how 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 important these numbers are going to be come the election next year. Well, uh, Lydia Wilson, what led you uh, and Rasha Al-Akidi uh, to this place where you've been working on this for a number of years? Um, you know, I know that she is from Mosul. Fill us in on how what led you to the, do this research and to raise the specter of this terrible situation. Oh, well, I've been working on radicalization for a long time now if in an academic context, I think probably, probably 10 years or more now um, that I've worked on pathways and mechanisms to radicalization. And in lockdown, I was unable to carry out any fieldwork, obviously. Um, and so I shifted my attention to radicalization online. And actually, I joined the University of Cambridge, uh, their computer lab. And I worked with the Cybercrime Center there on um, the on Manosphere and on the Manosphere, sorry, and misogyny and hate speech online. So I spent a year observing, reading um, these communities, which wasn't particularly pleasant at times. Um, and I... We, we we gained an understanding of a lot of these fairly misunderstood at times subcultures. And then I joined New Lines and then things began to change. So Jordan Peterson became a very prominent patron of um, Islam, patron or, or, or what can I say, not a patron and not a fan, but he became very interested and he hosted a lot of Muslim thinkers on his on his podcast. And that fascinated me because I knew he was popular in the Middle East. I'd noticed that for myself on a trip. And so I wrote about Jordan Peterson and then Andrew Tate came onto the scene. Rasha wrote about Andrew Tate. And then it was through our conversations on both of our articles where we really, uh, we really started to think that something new was definitely emerging. So it was more kind of, it was, it was more brainstorming with colleagues that really got us to think, no, this is urgent now. 
Uh, what do you have planned in the future? I mean, this is an ongoing situation, and uh, you, I'm sure there will be follow-up articles to the one that was in New Lines in this, I think, the summer issue. Um, uh, what do you got in your bag of tricks, so to speak, uh, coming up? Well, we've had a lot of interesting responses online, pro, anti, in between. Um, and there are a lot of in interesting points being made about how universal this is, as in, does it vary over different countries over the West? And there are also interesting points about this isn't just Muslims. You know, extremist Hindus, ex extremists of all stripes are, yeah. are, can find common cause on this. Yeah, just... Anybody that, who has these extreme views towards women can find a common cause. And that uh, that's deeply worrying. Um, but at the same time, it's still very unclear exactly how, how big this movement is going to become. And, and how influential it will be. So it's a question of keeping our eye on it. The other, the other major issue to keep an eye on is, of course, threats of violence, because there are elements of the manosphere who have become violent, notably in cells. We had the Isla Vista shooting. Um, we've had Toronto convict somebody over incel ideology, and we've had the Plymouth here in the UK. So everybody's having having more well. We are seeing much more violence in the name of Manosphere ideology, let's say, and that ideology is spreading explicitly to the Muslim world and with, with things being translated. And so we need to, we, we're kind of keeping an eye on that as well. Uh, but also, yeah, just watching it interact in this way, uh, we'll be we'll just be monitoring monitoring the influences going both from the Manosphere to the Arab world and from Islam back into the Manosphere. I understand that Russia had uh, engaged online with some of these people. Have you done that too? Yes, I have a little bit. I've I've interviewed people. I prefer interviewing face to face or on the phone or those sorts of things. And I've interviewed across the Middle East on these issues. Um, I I think online you can't ever really control what is being meant, and whereas in a conversation you can kind of have more control over over the discussion and kind of make make sure that it's going somewhere productive. Um, so yeah, we have different techniques, but they complement each other very well. There's also, uh, I should have asked this a little earlier, but not only is this uh, going to the manosphere and to dealing with the matrix, um, it's also going on in Canada. And there was some stuff that you covered in the article. You wanna share that a little bit about uh, the dire situation that, that might emerge in the North? Well, there was video footage emerged of children being encouraged to stamp on the pride flag at a protest. Again, at that protest, there were far right elements and Muslim elements joining together to protest LGBTQ issues being taught in schools. And of course, Toronto has had the incel van attack. Um, it suffered violence in the name of incel ideology of somebody not being able to get a woman and determined to kill women because of it. Uh, Lydia Wilson, I really want to thank you for coming on. I'm going to repeat the name of the article. It's in uh, New Lines magazine, which is a new magazine, and we are going to have more authors as well as our friend Danny Postal on. The article that you and Rasha Al-Akidi wrote is called How Andrew Tate and the Far Right Made Common Cause with Islamists. Uh, and it goes on to say Western groups find in Muslim communities what they believe is a prototype for a social contract free of wokeism and women's liberation. Uh, Lydia, is there a way people can get a hold of you or a website or something where they can read more of your stuff? Oh, yeah, newlinesmag.com. All, all of our information is on there. So, um, and all of, our, all of our articles are available for free. Newlinemag.com. Well, I want to thank you for staying up so late over there in Great Britain. I think it's probably getting close to 8.30 or so now in the evening. <laughs> and uh, I, I really, I'm really honored to have talked to you. And uh, I learned a lot, and it raised uh, some concerns and things I need to pay attention to. So feel free to come back on the show anytime you got more you want to share. Thank you. I'd love to.